healthy in this video, we are coming back to electron scattering and will focus on the elastic scattering. In the previous videos, you have learned that depending on whether there is energy loss or not, we can classify scattering events as elastic scattering and inelastic scattering. The elastic scattering is caused by the incident electron beam interacting with the nuclei in the specimen. In this atomic model here, if the incident electron beam gets close to the nucleus of the atom due to the coulombic force, the path will be altered, and the electron will be called the forward scattered electron, which will be used in TEM. If the incident electron beam gets really, really close to the nucleus, then it can be swung back, and it is termed as an backscattered electron. The backscattered electrons, or BSEs, are widely used in SEMs. When the incident electron beam interacts with the electrons in the specimen, it is called inelastic scattering, which will be discussed in more details in the next video. To summarize, the elastic scattering is caused by the incident electron beam interacting with the nuclei in the specimen. Inelastic scattering is caused by the incident electron beam interacting with the electron clouds in the specimen. I'd like to make some additional notes here. The first is the scattering angle, which we talked about in the previous videos. The scattering angles from elastic scattering are usually large, as shown in theta 1 here. The angles from the inelastic scattering are usually small, as shown by theta 2 here. Secondly, the Elastic scattering are not absolutely elastic in many cases. The nuclei in the specimen can slightly slow down the incident electron beam, taking a small toll on their energy. The loss of energy is converted into X-ray, called Brennstrahlung X-ray. Brennstrahlung in German means brake, like you're hitting a brake in your car. The nuclei in the specimen is slowing down the incident electron beam as if it's hitting a break. The third note is that we'll devote a huge part of this course to diffraction. All the diffraction patterns we see in the microscope or on the film are actually caused by the elastic scattering. Depending on the elastic scattering angle, we can use different models to predict or describe their behavior. At large scattering angles, we use the Rutherford cross-section. You have learned that cross-section in scattering describes the probability. Rutherford cross-section is defined as the probability for high-angle scattering by nucleus alone. The mathematical expression for the Rutherford cross-section is shown here. Taking into account the shielding effect and the special theory of relativity, it can be written as the equation 3.6. The equations look pretty complicated. Let's only focus on a few variables. The variables are theta, the scattering angle, lambda, the wavelength of the incident beam, and z, the atomic number of the specimen. From both equations, if theta, the scattering angle, increases, the sigma, the probability for scattering, decreases. If the lambda, the wavelength of the incident electron beam increases, that means the voltage of the TEM decreases, then the probability of scattering sigma increases. When atomic number Z increases, the probability of scattering sigma also increases. Let's look at a few examples. In all cases, you see that as the scattering angle increases, the probability of scattering decreases. And when the voltage of the TEM decreases, the probability of scattering increases. Finally, as the atomic number increases, the probability of scattering also increases. Because 1 over cross-section is equal to mean free path, that's something you have learned in the previous videos. We can also look at the effects of the acceleration voltage and z on mean free path. Higher the acceleration voltage, higher the mean free path. Higher the z from carbon to silicon to copper to gold, lower the mean free path. When looking at the elastically scattered electrons with small scattering angles, we use a new concept called the atomic scattering factor. In fact, 
when we talk about electron diffraction, the scattering angles are actually fairly small. The Rutherford backscatter cross section is not appropriate to describe the scattering events. Instead, we need to use the atomic scattering factor. The equation for the atomic scattering factor is kind of complicated. However, if we focus on the three parameters again, theta, lambda, and z, their behavior follows what you've seen in the Rutherford cross-section. Why the concept of the atomic scattering factor is important? It is because it determines the intensity of diffraction spots we see. I took an example from the paper published by Heo in the journal called Applied Microscopy. Iron aluminum is an intermetallic. If you look at the O01 planes, the first plane is all aluminum, the second plane is just iron, the third plane is aluminum again. Because aluminum and iron they have different atomic scattering factors, it will lead to different intensities in diffraction spots. It is illustrated by the diffraction pattern on the right. Looking at the O10 family of planes, you have dim, bright, dim, bright, dim, bright kind of intensities. If the sample were pure iron or pure aluminum, you will not see this alternating intensity in the diffraction pattern. I'll use the last slide to quickly introduce a new concept called the structure factor. Capital F is the structure factor. It equals to the summation of Fi multiplied by e to the power of 2 pi i, hx, ky, and lz. Fi is the atomic scattering factor. It offers the amplitude information when diffraction happens. hx plus ky plus lz offers the phase information. The concept of structure factor is very important for both the X-ray diffraction and electron diffraction. I have three video tutorials on this topic. You can check them out if you are interested in learning more about structure factor.